actually a friend wanted me to ask you about another film where you have probably the strangest death scene ever put on film, which is uh, Deported Women of the SS. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was, I needed the money. That was a joke. But I still really did enjoy that. That was fun. I'll tell you something, another incredible story. I'm standing in this little um, village, you know, up in the, in the hills in Italy, a medieval village where we're shooting. And there are all these beautiful nude women walking around, you know. Uh, wearing practically nothing or the little flimsy silk things and a tit comes out or, you know. And yet, you know, the men were more interested in my uniform than they were in the naked women. The power of that uniform is incredible. What was the climate like in Italy at the, you know, Nazi sort of exploitation films were very big at the time. I mean, did anyone ever get sort of touchy about that? Or no. what was the approach? Well, certainly I was not aware of it, if they did. Um, I mean, I thought of it, again, as I say, it was a joke. And I think that came to me as a result of Sal and Kitty. And, um, you know, just dressing up in the whole thing and histrionics and all. I mean, it was, it was all a load of old rubbish, really. <laughs> again, a fantastic way of making a living. I mean, you know, goodness me. Wouldn't mind having those years again. Did you ever see any of the finished films that you made? Very, very rarely. I've seen Beyond the Door, and I've seen some of the movies that I care more about, you know. Yes. Um, but I really don't, you know. I was making them for the money, you know. I needed to, and usually for the enjoyment, for the enjoyment of the people I was working with. <laughs> that film was just so terrible that the Sezioni de les Es Deportate, whatever, wherever that was called. And I <laughs> remember the director. I don't know where he came from. I don't think he's made a, a movie since. How he got it all together to make it. But uh, I remember I was traveling in, the, in the, the car to the set for the first day when he was in the seat in front. And at a certain point, he turns around and leans over and says, John, listen, I'm thinking about this end scene. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but I have got some things here for you. And he picked up this bag, and in this bag were two enormous dildos, which I think he was sort of had ideas of strapping on. Oh, just awful, awful. And it was so funny because I don't know what the leading lady was doing uh, uh, making the movie, probably for money, I don't know what it was. But she was all so prim and proper and wanted everything, you know, had to have her tits covered up with bits of this and oh, it's awesome. And my attitude was, what the fuck are you doing in a movie like this? What's that? What, what are you doing in a movie like this? You know, unless you're prepared to go the whole way. Anyway, you know, as I say, paid the rent. I was, you know, and I had a lot of fun. Was your death scene actually in the script? I mean, it, oh, yes. Was, yes, it was. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, can you imagine what would happen if you stick your water into a, a bunch of razor blades? So I just put myself in that position and that was it, you know. You know, I just looked upon it as I was getting paid to do a job and my job was to be as truthful as I could in that particular situation, uh, you know. And particularly after the experience I'd had with uh, Roma Violenta, I mean, I cannot tell you Although Beyond the Door was the biggest, the biggest grosser worldwide that I ever made, probably, uh, the actual effect of Roma Violenta was, was I mean, it was incredible. In the space of the minute it came out, I would walk out into the street and everybody knew who I was. Was there ever kind of a line between like, oh, these are, this film is art and this is exploitation, or was it sort of just doing as fast as they could? Not on those movies, no. But there were an awful lot of directors who I did work with who did have high aspirations. And I'll tell you, they were making much worse movies than the rubbish that, you know, was fairly honest about what it was. And of course, that was the great thing about Italian cinema at that sort of level. I mean, nobody was kidding ourselves that we were making great movies. Although I did make a couple of very good ones. But a lot of them were sort of homemade, um, mass production product, but made with old artisan qu 
inequalities. You know, everybody got together and uh, they held the, 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 the boards and everybody chipped in and, you know, you moved the furniture about. It was a sort of family affair, really. Uh, it was actually over a long period of time that it, it took place. It was about 79 when I began to sort of feel that I wasn't going to be able to continue making a living the way I had and the quality of the movies were actually getting poorer and poorer and poorer. But more importantly, I was getting paid less and less. So it was beginning to be difficult. And I said, I have got to look for something else to do because, you know, it's a bit like anything where it's easy come, easy go. You would have a good year and it was really easy to believe that's what was going to happen the year after and that it was going to get even better. And instead, you suddenly find yourself earning one-fifth of what you'd earned the year before. But of course, you'd been taxed at the same rate that you'd earned the year before that or you'd had to pay the taxes on the previous year. So you were really literally brought down to zero. And it used to absolutely destroy me when I suddenly found myself without any work. While I was working, it was great. But suddenly these periods started to get longer and more difficult. And I said, I have got to find something else to do. And that's how I got into real estate. I saw, you know, I came here, couldn't believe how cheap everything was. So I started buying things and fixing them up and then selling them and moving on. And that's, you know, I then got hit in 1990, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> but, but as I say, you know, so, this had all taken place over about 10 years, beginning in about 1979. And I then left and I went to London and I ran a, uh, a carpentry business for two, three years. And then I started to be called back to make these movies in about 82. And I made those until about 85. Then I came back to Rome and tried to make another go at it. And it was then that I got into the thing. So I came here in about 80. Seven, eighty-eight, uh, and then once I was here, I never did anything. But it's taken me about 14, 15 years to actually thoroughly get over it. Now I couldn't care less. But you know, I was always hankering to get back to the enjoyable days making movies like with Tinto or whoever it was or, or Fulci, and they were such fun, you know. Uh, anyway. That's the way it is. I'm quite glad now that I don't have anything more to do with it and, and really, you know, as I say, couldn't care. I never really rushed to see my own movies anyway. I just figured they were done, that was it, on to the next one. Yeah. One day, I got a call from a young man who said, this is Sage. And of course, you know who I mean, Sage Stallone. And I said, oh, hello, Sage. He said, are you the John Steiner? And I said, well, I'm not aware that there's another one. Why, why, why should you ask? Oh, my God, he said. Now, Sage knows every single line I have ever uttered as an actor. He can spout pieces of script that I, you know, I've forgotten them long gone. No, he remembers everything. And he was looking for a house, which we eventually found. And it was then he said, yes, but John, you don't know. You've got this. You've got this. Oh, I've seen it. And then it was then I realized that a lot of people in that age bracket do know these movies really well and collect them. And that was how I suddenly realized, yes, I have a following. But, you know. the, the fact is, they are, you can't really repeat them. You can't really remake movies like that because they were made at a cost which today you, you just couldn't repeat with that kind of quality. And uh, that's what their lasting power is. You know.